CIS. We're uh, going to have a conversation about the Doing Business Report 2015, going beyond efficiency. I recommend. I don't know if we have copies of the of the report. We do. Um, I think, as many of you know. I Uh, Dan, thank you very much for your for your kind words. Um, it's always a pleasure to be to be here at the center. Um, what I'd like to do today is basically divide my remarks in two parts. I would like to tell you uh, what is new in the Doing Business Report, uh, with a particular focus on two or three areas, 
and then I would like to tell you a little bit about what's happening to the data. One of the advantages of doing this, 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 this exercise on an annual basis is that by now we have 12 years of data for a very large number of countries, 189 to be precise, and we are able to...
I'm going to ask my friends uh, Paige and Sarah to join us up here. Um, it's this sort of work that keeps me in the development business. I think that it's very inspiring, the, the work and this, this new innovation of the distance to the frontier, I think, is particularly interesting. I'm going to ask uh, my friend Paige Alexander to start um, just to share a little bit how USAID uses the doing business indicators, how you work with them, because I, as I was saying earlier, I think they're sort of the, the mother of all policy dialogue discussion starters, but they're also important frames for, for sorts of roadmaps for the sorts of change that we want to see happen in the world. So Paige, thanks for being here. Thanks, Dan. Uh, thanks for the introduction and to CSIS for organizing the event. I'm privileged.
Thank you very much. Let me ask you one question. So you travel to many countries in your region. Uh, of all the countries, can I safely assume they all know what the ranking is every year on the doing business indicators? Oh, absolutely. And I think that uh, one of the problems, as I mentioned, playing to the test, one of the things AID did early on was to try to help a number of the countries increase their ranking because that was so important to them. And there's, there's one country in particular back in the day in Georgia that really wanted to increase its ranking. So it played to the test and we were very, there to help them to get the books on uh, to get the laws on the books. The problem is the books then stay closed. And so actually it's taken time for us to realize how to not only have them recognize this is a test they need to play to, but these interventions need to stick. So they're all very well aware of it. Thank you. Sarah, you have a very interesting role on the board in terms of representing the U.S. government to the World Bank and a little bit the World Bank to, to the U.S. government. So. Um, there are a spectrum of views on the World Bank Board about the doing business indicators. So talk a little bit about how, how the doing, you've been on the board now for several years. Talk a little bit about the doing business indicators and how you see them from the Treasury Department and how, how have the board dynamics evolved over time around the doing business indicators because they certainly elicit a spectrum of opinions. They do. Uh, thank you.
Or as a series of shareholders who either didn't like how they ranked or how they ranked vis-a-vis -vis their, their blood enemies over the mountains or, you know, this sort of a thing. But I also think there has also been a, an undercurrent, I can't prove it, of some staffers in the bank, I'll ask you this, not Augusto this, who have either for, out of professional jealousy or out of envy or out of philosophical disagreements have disliked doing business indicators all along. How much, did, how, is there, have you seen a change in how bank staff, other than the bank staff that work on investment climate or in the research department, use or think about the doing business indicators? I mean, because we just heard a very interesting conversation about how PAGE and how AID teams and how embassies use it. It's not clear to me how much outside of the doing business universe and investment climate universe at the bank and some of the research people it's been fully integrated because of some, sometimes because of bureaucratic issues, but I also think some because of some, you know, when you have 4.5 million visits, I can't, you know, as a think tank, I have, I have internet visit envy from Augusto for having so many, so I'm sure some of his, his colleagues in the bureaucracy are probably grumpy about that at some level, but. Well, I think, you know, I, I, you, it's used throughout. I mean, you can't, uh, I think that, that some, um, messes with doing business so the the Augusta I had a question for you my we have our friends from Australia here so when I looked at the map of some of the areas for improvement I think of Southeast Asia I looked at some of the parts of Asia where they haven't moved as much Australia could make a contribution if they were going to would be to help move the improve on on some of those investment climate issues in Asia could you just talk a little bit about why is it that some parts of Asia have been, are, are not as, you know, are in, in the needs improvement department. Could you just make some broad comments about that? I think that Asia is the part of the world that, where you see the greatest variance in terms of the doing business indicators. You know, how you countries like uh, Singapore and Malaysia and others who are near the top, and then you have countries like Myanmar and Bangladesh and others who are way, way down. So um, I think this is a reflection of the continent itself. You know, whereas you have greater homogeneity, let's say, in, in you know, ECA region, Europe and Central Asia, or you have greater homogeneity in Latin America, Asia being a very vast continent, you know, with a great deal of variance in performance, you know, this, is, this gets reflected in the doing business data. You know? just, just a little bit. whether it's Vietnam or, or oh, Cambodia. Oh, I have, I have a most encouraging story coming out of Asia. 
um, you know, there is this uh, uh, grouping called APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. bank. How's the investment climate work funded at the bank? Do you all have trust funds that support your work? And could you use trust funds from bilateral donors like Australia or Japan who are in the audience to support your work? Frankly, the United States. The, the doing business team is embedded in a large... I'm going to call on some of my friends and colleagues as well. I, I want to make sure I want to hear from my friend Thelma Askey, but I know there's someone here in the audience who's a former ED from Chile who's on the board. Who's that? Who's that person? So I want to hear from that person as well. So I want to hear from Thelma. I want to hear from the former ED from Chile. And then if there's, uh, and I'll take one or other hand, and we'll just we'll gather a couple of, of questions or comments. Anybody else? And my friend John Sullivan. So we're going to go with Thelma, the gentleman from Chile, and John Sullivan. So go ahead, Thelma. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I just wanted to preface my question with a, a, a statement, and that is that I hope uh, the doing business report kind of sticks to the objective criteria, because I think that's why you are so successful, and uh, you don't want to become a victim of your own success, where everyone yeah. wants you to take on 
an additional, perhaps more subjective analysis in order to support their policy decisions or for whatever reason. But if part of the reason it's embraced so dramatically is that people can see that the numbers you are presenting don't lie, at least very much. So I would encourage you to stick to the objective criteria. And uh, if you think you have criticism now, just wait until you move into the subjective categories and you really will have uh, criticism. That being said, uh, I, how do you take into account from 05 to 13 uh, changes in volume? fluctuations, and then how is labor taken into account? Whether or not you have a labor force that you can draw on, you know, is, uh, uh, whether or not it's a domestic labor, uh, the cost of importing labor, for example, would be quite high, I would think. But those three things, is that taken into account in the report, and just how would it be? This gentleman over here. supporter of the doing business report uh, so I, ha I have a very particular view and uh, at the board uh, I supported it a lot uh, and we have seen a, a big change in, in the last couple of years um, I have a few questions first well uh, we were surprised that Chile is not leading Latin American region in, in the last year uh, so can you explain a little bit on that, how the country that was ranked 34 the previous year now is 41, and behind uh, Colombia, uh, Peru, and Mexico? Okay, uh, what we can do? Uh, so we have a big challenge there. Uh, the other question is... Hey, buddy. Right here. Thank you, Dan. Uh, John Sullivan with the Center for International Private Enterprise. First, a small editorial note. I was really pleased to see that you picked Peru as your example uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it was Hernando de Soto that led the drive for property rights reform in Peru. And the early uh, doing business reports uh, did give him credit as being one of the people that inspired your methodology. So I think that, that works together really nicely. I'm sure Paige was pleased since USAID was a big supporter of Hernando. It's nice to see that you actually had an impact, right? Uh, it's wonderful. My question, though, comes back to flipping over to the other side of the world. We're a big consumer, and we utilize your materials a lot in our programs and projects uh, in emerging markets and developing countries. And in the process of doing that, one of the things that we noticed was that in countries like Russia, there is what we came to call the implementation gap. There is a, we've actually even got a small advertisement, we have a publication on this on our website, site.org. But uh, you actually see um, movements in the rankings that aren't reflected at the street level. A, an entrepreneur goes in in Sochi or somewhere else and says, look, I want to register my firm. And they say, well, I'm sorry, we're out of paperwork. 
we don't have the form. Can you come back tomorrow? Or in the Middle East, they like I. But I'd like to, both Paige and Sarah to just comment on any of the comments or questions that, that, that were put on the table. But, so, Gusto, go ahead and fire away. Um, thank you very much. All of them very, very good questions. I, I will comment briefly. Um, to the first question on, on doing business remaining objective and, and narrowly focused, yes, yes. I, I think that you are absolutely right. The strength of doing business is that it has maintained this narrow focus on business regulation. This is not to suggest that um, we are covering all the relevant areas of business regulation, and this addresses Sarah's point that, you know, could we do more while, while being very faithful to its, to its uh, you know, ethos and in still being focused on, on business regulation and obstacles to private sector development, um, you know, could we cover other, other, other areas um, of, of, that are crucial for the business environment? And the answer to that question is yes, we have a couple of, in fact, in the, in the, in the department there is a unit called the Special Initiatives Unit where we are incubating a number of different projects, uh, including, you know, one or two other indicators of doing business. And my own sense is that if we get the funding, you know, we are going to continue to do this. And in a medium-term perspective, maybe the, the doing business report will continue to be narrowly focused on business regulation, but, you know, with a broader, broad, you know, a broader benchmark of, of, of indicators. Um, uh, yes, um, the doing business data is hard data. I think it, it doesn't get harder than, than the doing business data. And I, I want to comment just on, on one of the reasons why, especially in smaller countries, as Sarah mentioned, you know, whether it's uh, small Sub-Saharan African countries, uh, Pacific Islands, countries in, in Southeast Europe and other parts of the world, the data is so welcome. And that is because there is very often so little other data you know, you would be surprised in how many countries in the world, I could give you dozens of examples, you know, the data on trade, the data on GDP, the data on poverty is very, very difficult to come by. And so when the doing business indicators come out, I think one of the, one of the reasons why governments are enthusiastic about it is, is it's a reference point. It is something that they can use to compare themselves to each other to look at what's happening in Singapore and New Zealand. I am so touched by the fact that more and more countries actually are no longer comparing themselves against their, their peers and their neighbors. They're actually looking at New Singapore and New Zealand. New Zealand has a very active program of technical assistance on business startup, you know, all, all over the world, many, many countries, because they are the gold standard for, for business startup. And so I, I, I agree. I think that uh, being able to deliver this data on a reliable basis, you know, every year is very, very important. It, it goes well beyond the impact of the indicators themselves. Um, you ask, ask currency fluctuations, labor market, uh, volume of trade. Yes, these things enter the, the enter the, 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 the uh, other than labor, these things enter the analysis in, in an indirect way. Let me give you an example. For instance, let's suppose that for whatever reason a country is booming along and exports are picking up. Maybe the, maybe the currency was, uh, was devalued, export competitiveness increased, uh, or maybe it's where they happen to be on the business cycle. And let's suppose that the much higher volumes of, of, of export in the short term could create bottlenecks uh, at the port. And this could actually have an adverse impact on the time that it takes to process. Um, what we find, of course, is that very, very often countries will respond to this by hiring new, new, new uh, uh, people for the custom service. But it could be the case that in the short term, uh, much higher volumes of, of trade, which put a burden on the existing system of control and, and cross-check at the border, you know, could have an adverse impact on, on the indicators. Labor used to be uh, part of the doing business framework, but in 2010 it was taken out. I think there were some issues of design with the indicator. It was criticized in many circles, and it remains a, a project in, 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 uh, you know, that is undergoing a, a, a phase of research. Um, the chief economist at the World Bank would, uh, thinks that, and I happen to agree with him, that a, a, a set of indicators um, that are tracking different dimensions of the business environment, which does not have a labor component, perhaps is somewhat flawed in, in, its, in, its, in its focus. And so it remains the intention of the chief economist at the World Bank to take a look at this, but you know, to perhaps come up with a more intelligent design than what we had 
in, in 2010. I think that much of the criticism, though, though by no means all, much of the criticism that was made against the earlier indicator was justified. Um, so th that, that has been a, a kind of a challenge that we have faced over the last several years.
the 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 issues of 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 uh, not not wrecking the secret sauce, if you will, in terms of some of these some of these additional things. Thelma, did you did you get your your question answered? Okay, okay, fine. Yeah. Okay. So let me now. I want to hear from Paige and from Sarah. Paige, go ahead. yeah, and I'd like to add, uh, to answer that too because one of the reasons we find this so useful is because they are adjusting. Uh, it is making changes and adjusting to a series of issues we've seen on the ground. I would just say I think you know I think you hit at the at the exactly the right question, which is that one of the key strengths is that it's objective, it's simple, it's comparable, comparable over time, comparable over space, and so you want to keep that while also. about the doing business indicators is I think it's the most powerful set of reforms and actions that the World Bank has done in the last 10 years. 2,000 reforms, over 2,000 reforms at this point worldwide? Yeah, it's 12 years. Over 12 years, over 2,000 reforms. Tell me what other, what other initiative at the World Bank or elsewhere has generated that kind of change. We can do all the econometric analysis we want. We can do all the, um, we can make all the advocacy we want, but if we don't harness both data and political will, uh, we're not going to get change to happen. The doing business indicators is, is one of the rare examples of seeing that happen. So uh, if I feel strongly about it, you bet. I absolutely do feel strongly about it because it's, it's been one of the most successful things that the World Bank does. And the fact that there are folks, even in the face of data and evidence, seem to have a problem with that just strikes me as just bizarre. So it's really, um, really a privilege to uh, host uh, the, our friends at the World Bank as well as uh, our friends at the U.S. government who, along with other uh, governments like Australia, like Chile, like New Zealand, like the Nordic countries, have made sure, and small African countries, frankly, have made sure that this, is, this most important uh, set of initiatives at the World Bank have remained in the face of, frankly, um, uh, sometimes really stupid um, resistance from sometimes within the bureaucracy and sometimes a small number of vocal um, uh, folks that have been against it. So uh, keep it up, uh, Augusto, we're with you. This is absolutely fantastic work and very inspiring. Please join me in thanking Augusto and the panel.